This morning, um, we're going to continue in our in our discussion, our, our study of, of culture. And uh, again, culture is something that uh, whether you recognize it, which I think if you, I think we, I think you do recognize it, it's just maybe not something that you think about a lot. Uh, a lot of times when you're part of the culture, you don't recognize the culture you're a part of, but you will recognize the culture that's, op- that's opposite of yours. Uh, it's kind of like uh, the other day I was, I was, uh, I was with a guy I work with. We, we, were, we were doing some cooking for a, for a school, and he talked about he, how, how much he loves to eat radishes. Is there anybody here that loves to eat radishes? What is wrong with you people? I, I had never had a radish in my life, so I thought, I'm going to try me a radish. I will never try another radish the rest of my life. It tastes like a mixture of dirt with laundry detergent, and they're spicy. Like, where did that come from? Uh, but, but he eats them like candy. Like, oh, they're, they're wonderful. Which, again, that's to each his own, right? Uh, but I'm thinking, how, how can someone enjoy this? You know? Uh, Anybody like beets? What is wrong with you? No. Again, I, I, I look at that and think, oh, it's... But, but, again, to each his own. Anybody like sauerkraut? What is wrong with you? you know. Again, you know, so there's... All right, how about liver? Anybody like liver? Oh, my goodness. You got to, the mixture. The mixture's the key. Well, I'm, I'm going to take your word for that. Um, and I know, I know your, your, you know, taste buds change. It's like, I think it's, I think it's Maryland that likes tomatoes, but don't like ketchup. It's a mental thing. Um, uh, and, and I, I, I got my own weird mixtures. I, I used to eat, um, not the expensive macaroni and cheese, like the cheap macaroni and cheese with the dry, with like the dry powder cheese with it. But I would mix it with, uh, applesauce and cinnamon. Anybody else? I may, I may be alone on that one, right? I don't know where that came from. I don't know why I ever did it, but, I, you know, I, I liked it. Um, again, we notice what's different <laughs> or what's different to us. Uh, you know, if you have fellow radish lovers, then, you know, you're wondering, well, it's so weird about that. But uh, so we, we definitely can recognize the differences and um very, very much so, and uh, other, rather than sometimes what, what is common. When you look at culture from a church perspective, I mean, yes, there are unique cultures in, in various churches, even within the apostolic churches. Uh, doesn't make one right or wrong or better than the other. It's just there, there is uniqueness within, within the church, and I, I think that's very interesting, the diversity of that. But when it comes to the, the, the separation from, from the world culture, there needs to be a drastic difference. Amen? I want to go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. Obviously, this is Paul's letter to Timothy. He is writing to Timothy. And uh, chapter 6, beginning at verse 5, it says, Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness from such withdraw thyself. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we bought nothing or brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, while, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith, and pierce themselves through with many sorrows. Here he addresses, he said, But thou, O man of God, flee these things. Everybody say flee. Not the, not the flea your dog has. This is the different flea. Flee these things and follow after. So you're, you're, you're running away from these things, but you're running towards or running with or running, you know, following after righteousness godliness faith love patience meekness he says fight the good fight of faith lay hold on eternal life whereunto thou art also called and has professed a good profession 
before many witnesses. There are many instances in Scripture where the admonishment is there, there are, there's a line here, you, you know, the, the things on the other side of that line you need to avoid, you need to, you need to rid yourself of, and then there's another line where those are the things you want to go towards. Very distinct, okay? It's not, that, that line really isn't that gray. It's pretty black and white. Uh, I come across a story, just one of those crazy stories, but a guy by the name of Nathan Grindle, I think I got a picture of him. He's 30, he was 33 years old, and he was known as a Jesus lookalike. And he walks into the cash, which I don't know that Jesus looked like that or not, but uh, he walked into the cash converters player championship dart competition. And uh, the crowd, there's a, a crowd of over 4,000 people in this place, their big dart competition. And they began chanting when they saw this guy, uh, stand up if you love Jesus, <laughs> all right? And uh, so they, the, the chanting was so outrageous and loud that it distracted one of the players. His name was Phil Taylor of Belgium. Uh, matter of fact, so much that it distracted him that... Uh, security had to escort Mr. Grindle off the immediate premises. He was left to watch the rest of the tournament from a monitor in another room. Uh, newspaper reported that in this post match, in his post match interview, Phil Taylor, the Belgian dart thrower, said this: "If I ever see Jesus again, I'll crucify him myself." Now we live in a world today that uh, is daily trying to remove all knowledge, all reference, all presence of Jesus from every fabric of culture. Uh, we are, in America even, considered now to be living in what's known as a post-Christian era. Uh, we find, uh, we, and I'm speaking as society, not you and I, but uh, Jesus to be too convicting, too distracting, uh, we've kicked him out of our classrooms, out of our legislatures, out of our entertainment, our homes, our marriages, our hearts. And uh, similar to champion, dart champion Phil Taylor, the world we live in doesn't want anything or anyone to take their focus off of their own self-centered pursuits. That's the issue. It's not so much that we're anti-Jesus as a society. It's just that you can't, you can't pursue yourself and Jesus at the same time. Amen. There's again a distinct line that you have to choose which way to go. No man can serve two masters. A decision has got to be made. Now, I'm going to say I know the decision that needs to be made. I mean, I think we all here will agree, hey, this is the decision that we need to make. We live in a society that says, no, that's not, it's not nearly as cut and dry as such. In Romans chapter 12, we referenced this verse last week, and it's a very familiar scripture uh, where Paul, writing to the church in Rome, he said, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, perfect will of God. Be not conformed to this world. Uh, we mentioned this again last week that if you allow the influence of the world system that we're that we're that we, we're in the world but we're not of the world right and if we allow the influence of this world system into our lives if we conform to this world it will not maybe not could but it will have an effect on your behavior behavior matters now, I realize there, there are churches today that, you know, the grace of God will cover all, you know, multitude of sins. And basically, you know, I, I will I personally never will forget years ago, my wife and I, we, we taught in a Christian school. Our, our, our children were attending the school. We, were, we helped out with teaching. And it was in a, it was in a church that uh, once saved, always saved. Uh, that never really could be explained to me. When the pastor tried to explain that, it, was, it didn't make a lot of sense. But the way that the children there interpreted it would, was basically, hey, once I accept the Lord into my life, I can go out here and do whatever I want. 
And so, because I was saved, I'll always be saved. Basically, I can behave however I want to behave, and I'm good. Now, that's, that's how, not saying that's how the church preached it, but that's how the kids interpreted it. And so, to try to convince them that, hey, your behavior matters, they, they were like, no, it, it doesn't matter. I can, I can do whatever I want, because once I'm saved, I'm always saved. Now, we, we don't believe that, obviously. And, and the reason is, again, because your behavior does matter. The, the, your choices matter. What you choose to be a part of, what you choose to not be, all of that matters. And that's where Paul said, do not conform to this world. Don't, don't conform to it. Don't, don't mold yourself into, into the likeness of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. 1 John chapter 2, again, another verse that, that is mentioned often. And uh, it says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. I mean, how, how, how much plainer can that be stated? Do not love the world. Now, what is it talking about when it comes to the world? Uh, it, it, we're not talking about green energy here. <laughs> We're not, I saw an advertisement the other day, because, you know, there's some of us that are on these low-carb diets, but this was a low-carb bun diet, that you can eat your bacon with the peace of mind that, that the production of that bacon did not, in, in, did not hurt the environment. Can I tell you the, the truth? When I'm eating my bacon, I don't care. I just like my bacon, right? But it was advertising low carb bun diet and i'm not i'm not a po i mean hey we take if i if i i i i eat a lot of or use a lot of those halls cough drops very little packaging if if i get caught throwing that out the window my wife gets irritated so i don't do that no more unless she's not in the car <laughs> i'm just being honest because she's really particular, you know. She, and, I, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not here to protest that. But this, when it comes to love, not the this is not talking about Mother Earth. This is talking about the world system. This is talking about the values of this world. Do not love this. Do not connect yourself. Neither the things that are in the world. First or Second Timothy chapter four, Paul said, talking about a, a follower of his named Demas. That Demas had forsaken him. He had, he had walked away from Paul. And uh, having loved this present world. There was, there was a, a, a connection that Demas had to this world. That he, he could not sever that connection. And because of that, he severed his connection with Paul. And he went with the way of the world. You say, well, I, I'll never do that. My point is, if you try to live both lives, if you try to stay connected to this world and stay connected to God, the world will win out every time. Ain't nobody that's walked away from God ever initially intended on doing so. James chapter 4, he says, You, you adul adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Enmity is not good. That's, that's, that's like hatred. It's like there's no, again, very, very definite line that, that, that you know, I, I do not want to have friendship with the world. Uh, that word friendship, it comes from a Greek word, philia, and it means it involved the idea of loving as well as being loved, meaning that this love I have for the, for the world, this friendship, it's going to love me back. But I'll tell you what, it will do. It'll eat you up and spit you out. There's no return. There's, that, that, that love is not return. Amen. The, the one that's the backer of this world system is the same adversary that's going to steal, kill, and destroy you, right? So that's why Paul says don't, don't even have friendship with it. Amen. The world doesn't return the love. John, in 1 John 2, he goes on in verse 16, for, and he identifies for all that is in the world. His, his, these are the things that, that, that you're, when you're not loving the world, these are the things that you're cutting ties with. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. 
It's not of the Father, but it's of the world. Those three categories, every sin that you and I could ever possibly commit will fall under one of those three categories. The lust of the flesh. 2 Timothy chapter 2 says, Flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Titus chapter 2 verse 11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world. We ought to live, we have a certain way that we ought to live and behave. But you cannot do that if you do not deny ungodliness. Amen. Again, the lust of the flesh. Everybody's got a flesh. Amen. If you're, if you're left to your own doings, it's not going to be good. Matter of fact, you are led away by the lust of your flesh. Amen. The lust of the eyes. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 tells us that neither is his eye satisfied with riches. Your eye, I mean, Eve, one, she should never have been there, but when she saw that it was good. Amen. That's what initiated that action. Your eyes are deceiving. You've you got to be really careful. The, we talked about this the other day, that the eyes are the window to the soul. Amen. And your heart is most deceitful, right? If you're left to your own self, you're going to, it's, it's, it's just not going to end well. The pride of life, James chapter 4, it says, Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that you ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live, or do this, or do that. Uh, but now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, those three areas. Those are the things, when I love not the world, those are the things that I'm severed ties with. Amen. So culture, church culture. Church culture entails the collective attitude, environment, the setting the health, the personality, the dynamics that are in play that create a unique gathering of believers. We have a church culture. Amen. Uh, every church is different. Amen. Now, hopefully, when it comes to apostolic churches, we are the same on doctrine. I, I don't, I don't want to be a part of a church that preaches another doctrine. I'm not looking for a modern doctrine. I still believe, hero is the Lord, our God is one. I still believe it takes repentance and baptism in Jesus' name for the remission of sins and the receiving of the gift of the Holy Ghost to be born again. I still believe that to be the gospel. I believe that. I believe there's, it's necessary to, be, to live a separated life from the world, a life of separation. Okay. We all can come to agreement on that. But even though that is the same, yet the churches are different. Different personalities. Different ways of doing things. Amen. Uh, Elder Johnny James says, If you think one church is just like another church, you'd probably think King Kong was just another monkey. Every church is going to be unique and is going to be different. Culture. Culture happens whether it's intentionally or whether it's unintentional. Amen. Uh, in, in, whether it's in, in your home, in, in your business, churches, other entities, culture is always going to happen, and you don't always intend for it to be what it is. Amen. Culture. So the church culture, and that's something, we again, we have been focusing, we've been discussing because... For one, I, I feel it is extremely vital. It's important. It's important to understand it. It's important to, to want for, for it to be a healthy culture. Because culture is, feeds on vision. People without a vision will perish. We need a vision, all right? Amen. So culture feeds on vision. Vision tells you where you want to go, but culture is what's going to take you there. We can, we can sit around and dream all day long of what we want to see happen. But if we don't have a healthy culture, 
that will help facilitate that dream, we'll never see the dream come to pass. So again, I think it's important to take a look at culture and identify the areas that, okay, these are good, but maybe, maybe we need to work on this. Amen. And, and here's, here's where the, the, the weight of culture when it comes to a church. Church culture is primarily fostered by the pastor who leads it. I learned this years and years ago, and I'm so thankful. I don't know where I heard it. I don't know who told it to me, but I, I, wherever it was, I believed it, and I, I held on to it. I, when I first started pastoring, um, I would, you know, kind of rub shoulders with these other pastors. I was a lot younger. I was 23 when I started pastoring, so I'm rubbing shoulders with people that, men that are well up into their 30s and 40s. I mean, you know, old people back then. And I remember, you know, I'm, I'm sitting at tables with them, and, and I, I know I don't know nothing. I know that. And I, I remember, not every one of them, but a few would like, I remember how they talked about their congregation, how frustrated they were. And, and it, you're like, ooh, well, I'm glad I don't pastor your church. But when I come across this principle that the congregation of the church that, that, a per, that I, I pastor is a reflection of me. And so if I'm going to just complain all day about the congregation I pastor, you're reflecting me. So I learned, you know what, I'm not going to complain about the congregation, even though I know you're a reflection of me. So again, church culture is primarily fostered by the pastor who leads it. Secondarily, amen, it is, it is fostered by the faithful members who call it home. It's not on just one set of shoulders here. Amen. It's all of us together, but, but it's, it does begin with me. J.T. Pugh said this, Whatever is in the heart of the pastor will come out in the congregation. Amen. That's why this guy right here, my first line of, not defense, but my, my first line of priority is my spiritual walk with God. Amen. Because if I ain't got myself on an altar, neither will you. I believe, I believe that what's ever in the heart of this pastor, it will come out in the congregation. So I, and I take that very seriously. Because I know I've got imperfections. I know I've got flaws. But I'm telling you, I, I, that's why I've got to have an altar in my life. And uh, for me and for you. We all benefit in that. Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 18, it says, For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. I was telling the ministry for service, my man, one of my favorite preachers. Never have met him in person, but I was a faithful subscriber to their YouTube channel. And it was Brother Harold Hoffman. He passed away last week. They had his funeral yesterday. He had a, a brain tumor several months ago, and um, in, ultimately it, it, it took his life. And I just, ah, oh, I, I was telling him, man, I miss hearing his teaching. He was just a, just a, wonderful teacher and uh, during and I watched the funeral service that was held yesterday and and they man they played a lot of clips from his sermons and one of his sermons and I remember watching I remember the day I watched this sermon because I would always go home in the Sunday evening and I, and I would I would tune in to that YouTube channel and listen to the service that day and and I forget the exact title of his message I think his message was just leave me alone but he, he talking about it as a pastor, it was his purpose and his his calling to to agitate the congregation, <laughs> to keep the congregation on their toes, to not let them just be stagnant. But it was his place to continue to stir them, push them, try to motivate them, because because again, there's that temptation to just kind of, you know fall back on our heels and just kind of float through life. And I'll never forget that. And again, many other things that he would say and, 
and I, I, would, I would glean from, and, and again, so enjoyed his ministry. But that's why, as a, as a pastor, it, it is my, it's my duty, it's my, it's my calling to, amen, to call those things that, 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 you know, call them out. Say, hey, especially the day we're living in. And, I, and I, I'm, not a, I'm not a big list guy. Like, here's a list of rules y'all need to follow. But, but we need to understand, when it comes to culture, the things of this world are not things that we need to mix ourselves with. Again, Philippians said, those whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, they mind earthly things. But Colossians chapter 3 says, set your affection on things above, not on things of this earth. Amen. This world is not my home. I'm only passing through. Amen. I don't know about you, and, I, and I'll be honest with you, I, I guess maybe as I am getting older, I, I, I do consider um, I've, got more, I've got more years behind me than I probably have ahead of me now. I'm at that point, midlife, and uh, the, the, the thought of the process of, of leaving this world, the question of what's that going to be like. And I'll be honest, the, the old flesh gets a little trepidatious in, the, in that subject, but when I connect to where I'm where, where my purpose is to what the word declares you know what to be absent from this body means to be present with him how much do I really love him I want to be present with him there is nothing in this world that's that's ever the Bible says if you gain the whole world but you lose your soul you ain't profited anything I'm telling you, I want to set my affection on the things that are above. I want to make sure that the line is clearly drawn in my life, that the world is not. Because the more, the more I try to mix myself with the things of this world with the intention of not going too far, and I know that might be your intention, but I promise you the world will get a hold of you before you're real. That's why the line has got to be clearly drawn. Culture. I want to have a healthy culture in my life. We read, in, again, 1 Timothy chapter 6, amen, where Paul said in verse 11, But thou, O man of God, flee these things. Follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. That word flee, when it says to flee these things, the things, again, that the world produces. It means to run away. <laughs> it means to avoid the danger. It means to disappear quickly. This is not something you do in a few steps of progression. You let it go and you walk away. You, I mean, you make it happen quickly. You get rid of, you drop it, you let go. You move forward, you move beyond. My concern in the hour we're living in, the access that we have to all so many different things, amen, we justify so much by, well, at least it's not as bad as it could be. At least, at least I'm, I'm, no, I'm no longer, and I'm just making this as a suggestion, at least it's no longer the, the pornographic images that we used to look at, but yet still they're not, they're not things we should be looking at. Well, well, well at least I'm, you know, at least, you know, it's not what I used to be. We, we, we justify, but what it, what it is, we're still keeping a ever so slight grip. You need to run away. You need to avoid. You need to disappear quickly. Why? Because that connection that you make to the things of this world will affect the culture that you live. I'm telling you, church, you need to have a clear line of of separation in your life clear and I realize even nowadays that that can be a struggle in the sense that it's coming at us from so many directions you may have one area of your life where oh I'm, I'm, I'm not I don't go there no more but there might be another area of your life that that well that that I'm, I'm still working on that you need to have a clear line that says, you know what, if it's not of God, I don't want to be a part of it. I don't want to be connected to it. I don't want to enter in my mind. I, don't, I, 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 need, I need it completely separate. Why? Because I'm telling you, there's a world system out there. 
It'll destroy you. In order to not conform to this world, there must be a continual pushback against the things of this world. You say, Pastor, you're, you're sounding awful old-fashioned. No, I'm sounding biblical. <laughs> because I promise you, there is a underlying motivation from the enemy. <laughs> he is walking about seeking whom he may devour. And if you're not on your toe, he said, be sober and be vigilant. You've got to, you got to be on alert at all times. I don't want the world infiltrating my life I want there to be a clear line of separation and I, why? because I want to I have a culture a spiritual culture in my life that is healthy amen I'm telling you God God does not he, he, he doesn't commune with, with dirty vessels he just doesn't do it and please understand me this is not a fear see type perspective it's not what well, you mean you mean i got to get good to get god no 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 we get god to get good but you got to make right choices god is full of mercy he is full of grace amen i i saw something the other day i don't know where i saw it might have been a facebook post and i i may i'll probably butcher the saying but something to the effect it's hard to cast out a devil that you continually entertain something along those lines that's, 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 that's trying to play both sides of the game you cannot do that amen God's full of mercy yes he is but he also gives you and I the, obli the obligation to make the right choice I choose I want to live for God I want to I have a clean walk I, I know that me as a pastor, I have a responsibility and the calling that God has put in my life that, that I, I, I will be, I, I am held accountable as to how I live my life, how I lead you as a congregation. I'm not responsible for your choices. You're going to make your own choices, but I am responsible for how I live mine. And I will stand before God and how I did that. And so I take that very serious. And I'm telling you, church, I just, I don't, we, we, we kind of stumbled onto this culture thing and, and to be honest with you I really didn't connect this at the beginning thinking that this but as the more I've studied culture it's, it's, it's separation <laughs> amen because if I, if I don't the world out there the culture out there will influence me and I'm telling you this, this book is very clear what's, what's right is right what's wrong is wrong amen and we got to quit trying to justify our actions and say, God, I want, to be, I want to be what you want me to be. I want to live. I want to fight the good fight of faith. So to do that, you've got to have a continual pushback against those things. You think the world's going to let up? <laughs> Amen. You think, you think it's going to get better? <laughs> Amen. Just read some news headlines. It's, it's not getting better. But I'm telling you, greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. Amen. The darker the world is, the brighter our light's going to shine. Amen. The, the more, the more uh, uh, again, adversity that we may face, I promise you, God is right behind. I, I, I spoke with a pastor the other day, uh, last week, and he's like, listen. He said, when, when you've got things coming at you, when there's adversity coming at you, he said, that's a good indication that you're doing something right. He said, my advice would be just keep on pushing harder because I'm telling you, God will always come through. Amen. So culture, church culture. Amen. Pray for me. I appreciate your prayers. I need your prayers. I'm not one to say, hey, I'm the pastor. I know everything. I'm telling you, there's a lot I don't know, and I need all the help I can get. But I assure you that I'm going to have an altar in my life. And that reflection is going to be on you as well. Now, you're going to make your own decisions. But I'm going to tell you, it's not going to be on my shoulders that, well, the reason they, the church don't pray is because you don't pray. I'm going to pray. Amen. And I believe, I believe, again, together, primarily it starts with me, but you as a congregation play a major role as well. And we are going to foster a good, healthy culture in this church. We're going to be a church that prays. We're going to be a church that worships. We're going to be a church that has a burden for the lost. We're, going to be a, we're not going to be perfect. I know that. But I'm telling you, we're going to have a pure heart. 
Amen. We're going to reach this. And God, we're going to plant, we're going to water, and God's going to increase. Everybody said amen. amen. Let's stand here today. Lord, we are so thankful. God, we're grateful for your presence. We're thankful for your word. And Lord God, is again, culture, it's, it's intentional, it's unintentional. But I pray today, Lord, from the pureness of our hearts, God, as we lay ourselves on an altar and, God, present our bodies a living sacrifice, that, Lord, you, God, will accomplish within us your desire and intention. And for that, God, we are thankful and we give you the praise for all that you have done and all that you're going to continue to do. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen.